just go ahead and Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It's good to see you guys. It's uh, always exciting to be able to worship God together. I hope that you've had a wonderful week. Uh, turn to your neighbor just real quick while you're grab grabbing your seat and ask him, what has God done for you this week? Well, I hope that God's blessings have been apparent, and I hope also, along with what God has done for you, what have you been able to do for God and His kingdom this week? So we're going to watch a video here for our kids' church, and I was previewing it. It is so cool. This is like the new generation's flannel graph. So uh, I don't know where this stuff was when I was a kid, but it's really cool. We're going to look at from Adam to Jesus here. So we'll do that, and then Jordan's going to be leading our worship. Before he came to earth as a human being, God the Son was with the Father. No one created him. He has always existed. God created the first people. Ooh. Ooh. Adam and Eve. But they did not obey him. All along, God planned to send his son to earth to save people from sin. At just the right time, Jesus came to earth as a baby. He was born to Mary the wife of Joseph. Jesus is different than any other baby who was ever born because he is fully God and fully human. Like all people on earth, Jesus' family had a history, a family tree. Jesus had parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents, back and back for many generations. Jesus was born into the family of Abraham and the family of King David. Abraham had a son named Isaac. When Isaac had a family, one of his sons was named Jacob. Jacob was part of Jesus's family. Years later, a man named Solomon was born into Jesus's family tree. He married Rahab, who hid the Israelite spies when they came to Jericho. Rahab had a baby named Boaz. Oh. Boaz was a farmer, and he married Ruth. Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed. Oh. Obed's son was Jesse. Mm. Jesse had many sons. His youngest was David. David was just a boy when he was chosen to be Israel's king. King David liked to write. He wrote songs called Psalms, and some of them were about the time when Jesus would come to earth. Other people in Jesus' family were kings too. David's son Solomon was a king. King Jehoshaphat was part of Jesus' family, and so was Uzziah, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Josiah. 
God's people return home from exile in Babylon. Then Sha'alatel was born. His son was Zerubbabel. Later, Naphtan came along. Naphtan's son was named Jacob, and Jacob's son was named Joseph. Joseph is the man who married Jesus' mother, Mary. Joseph raised Jesus as his own son. Jesus was truly God's son, the Messiah. Jesus came to earth as a human. Jesus had earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, but his true father is God. Through Jesus, God kept his promises to Abraham and David. Jesus saves people from their sins and adopts them into God's family. Everyone, please rise with me if you can as we uh, worship our Father, start our Sundays with songs. <clears throat> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Jesus Christ died for me. And he took away my sins. I will live with him for eternity. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we pray the prayer of your kingdom and the kingdom that you have there in heaven that we want here on earth. Lord, as we pray to you this morning as a congregation, we pray that the leaders around the world will put your kingdom first in front of their own agendas. 
And Lord, as we think of asking that of our leaders of our nations, we ask the same of the leaders around the congregations around the world, that those leaders will put your kingdom first and not those traditions of themselves. But Lord, to do all that, we know that's got to start with ourselves. And Lord, so we ask this morning that we put your kingdom ahead of the will of ourselves and that we will worship you, put your will first, and we know that that will make the world a better place. And Lord, as we ask for that prayer, Lord, we ask that you open our eyes and help us understand, as you did with the apostles, open our eyes, opens our hearts, help us to get it so that we can show folks around us the kingdom here on earth and they can have that home for eternity in your kingdom. Lord, we ask all these prayers in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing one more song before we give the floor to Brother Jeff. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful, mighty with power. God will deliver me, of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Amen. Good morning, family. Good to see all of you today. Glad that you are here on this bright, beautiful Sunday morning. Um, we had a discussion in Bible class this morning earlier. Didn't you enjoy the cool air this week? I hope you did, because you're not going to see any more for a while. So appreciate that and be refreshed. Hope you're going to be refreshed this morning by being in worship. Welcome those who are watching live stream. We pray that you will know that we're thinking about you and miss you and look forward to the time when we can all be together had some people ask me about what we're going to do about mask. We'll tell you next week. Okay. So just hang in there. Just hang in there. Main thing right now is just be wise, be concerned about others, be concerned about yourself and uh, do, do, do those things. I've been thinking this week about moments in my life that I, that I like to replay. They were, they were enjoyable experiences and I like to replay those things. I like to be, I like to be built up in, in those areas. Uh, a lot of those uh, happened, uh, I was talking to Sam this morning about a guy that we, have in, uh, we know in common, he and Laura, by, by the name of Kenny Barfield. Uh, Ken, Kenny Barfield taught out at Mars Hill Bible School when Sam and Laura were there, but he spoke at a lot of the youth functions, and one of his uh, primary things that he did was Christian evidences. And he could just kind of make things come alive for you make things interesting, make sure they were digestible and those kinds of things. So really, really enjoyed those experiences uh, that we had at the Training for Service series. Do y'all remember those? Or are y'all too young for that? Uh, and so we'd have that out of the school. When I was in college, I was able to travel some with campaigns and a couple of my, my favorite events. One was in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And we had, a, we had a devotional because we were about to kick off a two-week-long campaign, door-knocking campaign, and we went out to the White Sands Missile Range at sunset. And we were able to see 
Oh, how many colors dancing off those uh, sands around us. And we were singing together. Uh, and one of the songs we sung was, Have You Seen Jesus, My Lord? It was such a powerful moment. The other thing we did while we were there is uh, the night uh, before we started the campaign, we went up on the side of the mountain. And on the side of the mountain is uh, uh, like a little... Uh, area where you, you can look down on the city. And the, the guy who was leading the preaching that week uh, got up and he talked about Matthew chapter 23, where, where uh, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how off I would have gathered you under my wings like a mother and does her chicks, but, but you would not. And talked about lost people in the city. So those were just powerful, powerful moments for me. And then uh, since I've been here, some of the most powerful moments that I've experienced was when a number of us would go to Tulsa to the Soul Winning Workshop. And they were just dynamic experiences of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood and experiencing great preaching and, and evangelism and uh, <laughs> dynamic singing like we probably don't get to experience too many times in our lifetime. Great sermons. And the other day, I was looking at the front of a Bible that I got. It was in 2001, Steve. And the theme for that week was, um, have you ever seen a cross? That was the theme for the week. And, and it just came back to me sitting and listening to this guy talk about the cross of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and it, the theme song for the week was, every time I see a cross and what it reminds me of. But as I was also contemplating that this week, I couldn't help but think about what it would have been like. What do you think it was like the first night after Pentecost when husbands and wives had retired for the evening and they just talked about the experiences of the day? What would that have been like? Talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the gospel, 3,000 people responding to that and being baptized. And then just the days and the weeks ahead of what was going on in Jerusalem that had never happened before, not only in the preaching of the gospel, but in sharing in the events of that day where they were serving each other, they were meeting with each other from house to house, they were breaking bread together, and they, they were just reaching out to people around them. And it says that, and they had favor with all the people. I, I, I'm thinking, man, what would that have been like to experience those moments? And so today, as we continue in this series called The Contagious Community, we're going to talk about some more things about that. Right now, if you'll stand with me, we're going to try to sing one more song together. I hope that you will sing out here. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Oh, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the sea will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Amen. Thank you so much. Somebody said the other day, why don't you sing that song? I said, because it gets me pumped up to preach. So hope it gets you pumped up to hear preaching. Okay, because that's what we're going to do. Text this morning begins in chapter 4, verse 32. 
All the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands and houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, uh, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement, sold the field he had, he had owned and brought the money and put it at the disciples' feet. Sounds like to me that Jerusalem was the place to be, okay, during this particular time. But also remember, they had never experienced like this anything before. They'd never been a part of a community that was like this. This wasn't like they could run over to uh, the next town over and there was a church of Christ over there. There wasn't one. This was the first one. This was it. There wasn't one down south. There wasn't one over on the seashore. This is it. It was the Jerusalem church, the body of believers who had believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He had been killed, that He was raised again the third day. He had been exalted to the right hand of God. He poured out the Holy Spirit. People came. To... This was it. This was this body of believers. It sounds like a place where the believers were just kicking it as they were uh, living out the story of Jesus. I mean... Don't forget, they hadn't been going to church 40 years, okay? They hadn't, they hadn't been Christians like some of you for 65 years. This was all new. But they were responding to the events of the day, which corresponded to the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't like they had a body of doctrine. It wasn't like they had these people, this, hey, this is how you do, this is how you live. They were being responsive to what they knew. And that was the apostles' teaching as they were leading them to follow into the steps of Jesus. <clears throat> but as I thought about this week, I thought to myself this. I said, my question is this. Everything's going good. So where is Satan? Where's Satan? The liar, the deceiver, the accuser, the tempter. Where, where is Satan, the one who dared to enter the garden where God and Adam and Eve live and dared to say to Eve, now let me really tell you about God. Did he really say that this was the case? He lied to you. This, this, this is Satan. Where is Satan in all this? He's the one who would be so bold to actually tempt Jesus himself, God in the flesh, and said, hey, I'll come back at a more opportune time. It's the same Satan who requested to sift Peter like wheat. This is this where Satan that entered into the heart of Judas, the one whose heel was struck and prophesied that he would be overcome in Genesis 3.15. Where was Satan, um, who had been struck by this, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus, given a name above all names and dominant power, where was Satan during the pouring out of the Holy Spirit? Where was Satan when thousands of people were repenting and being baptized and being filled with the Holy Spirit? Where was he? Well, you got to know he wasn't too far away, right? You got to know he's somewhere around. He's looking at this situation over and he's lurking, right? He's plotting, planning, scheming. He's preparing his arsenal of fiery darts. And to tell you the truth, he's looking for someone to devour. That's what he's looking for, okay? So he's there. He's evident in those, not evident in those passages of Scripture, but guess what? He's close by. Enter Ananias and Sapphira. Remember this? You'll recall that people have been selling their land and their houses, 
bringing the money to the apostles, laying it at their feet. They were distributing it. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, had a field. He sold it, brought the money to the apostles. Ananias and Sapphira sold some property too. And they got a certain amount of money from it. But they decided they would keep part of it for themselves, which was fine. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is they were only going to give part of it to the apostles. And when they were asked about that amount, is this what you sold it for? They said, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what we did. And guess what? They both lied. But they didn't lie to Peter. Text says they lied to the Holy Spirit. And so Peter says, how is it, how is it that, guess who? Satan, I told you he was close by, right? Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, not to men, but to God. Now that really shouldn't surprise us too much because Satan is the father of who? All liars. But he was close by. He knew something about them somewhere along the way. They decided, boy, you know, that's a lot of money and and everybody's giving money. So if we keep a little bit for ourselves, it's no big deal. And you know what? It wasn't until they lied about it. Satan filled their heart to lie. God could not tolerate Satan's work that led to lying and deceit and hypocrisy because those things tolerated could have destroyed the faith of many young believers. And so after confronted by that, you know that Ananias, he fell down and what? Died. Sapphira comes in, she lies, she falls down and dies. But look at the response. Great fear sees the church and all who heard about these events. Now look, next chapter. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together at Solomon's colonnade. No one uh, else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Satan was close by. He's going to do his thing, but God's more powerful. And when God does His thing, it can cause great fear to come upon the church and other people if they recognize it. So just know that even on the best day as we look at it, Satan's somewhere, somewhere close by, lurking, looking for someone whom he may what? Devour. And all he has to find is a heart that's not in tune with God. But because of what happened here, it continued to be a contagious church. Secondly, enter the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the Sadducees and the Pharisees, about 70 or so of them, and the high priest. There were more Sadducees in the Sanhedrin than than the Pharisees. And they were not happy with the apostles because they were teaching the name of Jesus. Because they had said, look, Don't teach in His name. They told Him that what? More than once. We told you not to teach in His name. And yet, they said, you go out and do it anyway, and you're filling Jerusalem with this doctrine, plus you're trying to make us look bad. You're trying to make us look guilty. And then the Sadducees were unhappy with them because they were proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they're looking bad on a lot of counts, because the people are looking favorably upon them, and they just didn't know what to do with them. They didn't know what to do with Peter and John. Uh, People were looking favorable toward them, and a notable miracle had been done that a man who had been lame for 40 years was made to walk, and guess what? He was standing right there with them. So they said to themselves, look, a notable miracle has been done here. What are we going to do about this? Did, Did I say this, having brought the apostles uh, they made them to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders, not just orders this time. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. 
yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. The Sanhedrin were greatly disturbed. <coughs> the text says that they were filled with jealousy. They were angry that they did not stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Uh, they were furious, the text says, and wanted to do what? Put them to death. That's what they wanted to do. What I want you to know is all those things, jealousy, anger, murder, are all evidence of Satan's presence. They're all evidence of Satan's presence. We know that because it was all those things that infuriated them enough to do what? To kill Jesus. And Peter says, you, you murdered him. And now they wanted to, to murder Peter, James, and John. And if you think about it, one of the guys who was a Pharisee, who was probably a part of this process, was a guy named who? Saul? How about Saul first? Then we'll get to Gamaliel. But Saul, who sat at Gamaliel's feet, and you'll remember in the chapter 6, Saul was standing there giving approval when who was being killed? Stephen. And then Saul goes on this rampage to destroy the church, and the next day says he was breathing out what kind of threats? Murderous threats. Which tells you that while they might have done this stuff in ignorance or all good intention, Satan was present in what was going on there. He had his finger in this thing. And they were ready to kill him. But Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, said, look, if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail, right? It will fail. But if this is from God, you will not be able to stop these men and you will find yourself fighting against God. And that happened an awful lot. You'll remember this quote from Peter and Jesus, get behind me, Satan, right? Because you do not have in mind the concerns of what? God, but the concerns of men. They weren't really concerned about what was going on with God. They were concerned about the fact that these guys were making them look bad. They told them to stop doing it. and They wouldn't do it. And then on top of that, they were talking about the resurrection of Jesus, and that angered them even more. They were ready to put him to death, but Gamaliel's speech persuaded them, and he had them flogged. Okay, <laughs> Couldn't just let them go. They flogged them uh, and ordered them. I always think this is so funny. Ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. Okay, Not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. But look at this response to Satan's activity. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped preach, teaching and proclaiming, here it is, the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Never mind, they had been strictly ordered not to and flogged. They counted a joy to suffer for the name of Jesus, and they kept on teaching and preaching Jesus in spite of Satan. <coughs> Thirdly, <coughs> enter grumbling and murmuring. It was in these days when the church was meeting needs, where Jesus was being preached, where notable miracles were being done, that in these days the number of disciples was increasing. So in spite of all this activity, <clears throat> the number of disciples were increasing. And so everybody's very busy. The Grecian Jews, Grecian Jews would be Jews that had a Hellenistic background. They might have been born somebody else, somewhere else, but were of Jewish descent. Like Barnabas was where, from Cyprus, and he would be a Hellenistic, a Hellenistic Jew. And so the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, those that were from Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, uh, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. <clears throat> now what I want you to see is that that was probably the case. With everything going on, right, they could have been easily been overlooked. They weren't neglected per se, but overlooked. But there's nothing that Satan enjoys than a little grumbling and complaining. Do you know that? If you don't believe that, go take a look at the children of Israel and read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look what happened to those people that grumbled and complained. And then in the book of Philippians, 
where he's talking about uh, being like Jesus, being humble like Jesus, and being a part of the fellowship of Jesus. He says, do everything without grumbling and complaining. So, if, But there's anything that Satan likes, it's a little grumbling and complaining going on. It gets everybody focused on something they shouldn't be focused on. But the apostles took it seriously. Uh, they rem to remedy the situation. They knew the implications if this went on, that it could really do damage to what they were trying to accomplish. And so they said to the people, I think the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews, look, I want you to look out from among yourselves, 12 men who are full of wisdom, full of faith, and full of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to turn this responsibility of the daily feeding over to them. And so this is what the text says. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait tables. And we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Look what the response is. So the Word of God spread. They dealt with that issue. They weren't going to let Satan get a foothold. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. It was already increasing. And now after this problem was handled in a loving way, where it involved the brethren and they chose men who were full of faith, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, the, disciples, the apostles were about to be able to get back things they need to be doing, like praying, right? Like Jesus and ministering the Word of God. And a large number, guess who? The priest became obedient to the faith. So listen, folks, the moral of this story is that Satan is always at work strategizing. And he will do, try to do anything to thwart the effort from telling people to stop preaching Jesus by force. It goes on around the world all the time. We don't really experience it or haven't experienced it. But you can go to parts of the world right now where it'll cost your life or you'll go to prison for preaching the name of Jesus. Satan's still alive and well. Of uh, filling hearts of believers to lie, we say, no, listen, we got to guard our hearts, right? Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees? It's not what you put in your body that defiles you, but it's what comes out of your heart, right? And it's this kind of thing that happens if our hearts aren't in tune, if we aren't guarding our hearts with all diligence, Satan will enter our hearts just like he did Judas and brought betrayal and could cause us to lie, to be hypocritical, to be lack of integrity and not be the people we want to be. And by the distraction of grumbling. It is, we think, folks, it's an American right to grumble. I vote and I pay my taxes, therefore I will grumble when I'm ready. Okay, if you want to do that, that's not so in the body of Christ. It's not so in the body of Christ. The President of the United States doesn't rule the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is our Lord. And he says, do away with this grumbling and complaining. Don't do that. It's not going to accomplish anything. It's something that's in your heart that needs to be dealt with. And if we're going to do what we need to do as the body of Christ, we all have to be on the same page. Guess what? It could even be something that you'd be justified about. But grumbling and complaining is not the way to handle it. Find a way to deal with it within the confines of Scripture, of finding spiritual brothers and, and spiritual sisters to help you deal with the issue so that the kingdom of God can go forward because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about what Jesus is trying to do in the world. In any of those attempts, if they had succeeded early on with this young community of faith, what they were trying to do could have been stymied. And so they, I'm so glad that they recognized the devil's schemes. They yielded to the power of God, and they yielded to Jesus, and they yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. So folks, listen to me. As we labor together as believers, as disciples, as the church, it's our job to preach the name of Jesus Christ. To preach Jesus Christ as the Son of God 
to preach Jesus Christ as the resurrected Lord, that's why we are here. Satan doesn't want us to do that. Okay, So he's going to find a way to try to thwart us. We need to guard our hearts against Satan. And we do that by staying in the Word of God and by letting the Holy Spirit fill up our hearts. If the Holy Spirit fills up our hearts and the Word of God protects us, Satan has no place to stand. But we got to be receptive to the Word. we got to be submissive to the Word. And we got to be receptive to what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. And it's more about things like love, joy, peace, patience, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. There's not anything against those things because that's where the Spirit of God lives and the Spirit of God works. And the third thing is, it said earlier that grace of God was upon And no matter what we're doing, we need to be filled with grace toward all. You know, sometimes we're going to be cranky with each other. <laughs> sometimes we may say things to each other we ought not say. Sometimes we, ought to have, we may have attitudes. But I'm going to chalk it up to this. Sometimes we all have a bad day. But guess what? I'm going to give you grace. Because that's what God does. For all of us. Because we are in an undeserved place. In an undeserved relationship. Not based on anything good I've done, but in spite of the good I've done and the bad I've done. He still gives me grace. And so if we go forward as a church into this world in which we live, we cannot be like the world. We be like the body of Christ. And we are always aware of Satan's activity. Because he's always around, he's always plotting, he's always lurking, he's always strategizing to see who he may devour and to see what crack he can get in to stymie the gospel of Christ going forward. We can't let that happen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We're so glad that we got to be here today and to be together. Uh, Father, it's a, it's a beautiful day outside. It's a more beautiful day in here where hearts have come together, that we have lifted our voices up in song, we have prayed together, and Father, we're going to be communing together in just a few minutes. Father, uh, as we leave here today, help us to be aware of Satan, but help us to also understand, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we can overcome by keeping our hearts and our minds protected and our priorities and our goals in the right place. Father, we ask for your help to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Jordan's got a song for us. We're gonna, it's, a, it's a good song. It's an older song, but it's one that is so true and so powerful. It'll help prepare us for communion, but if you need to respond for the Lord's Supper, it's the time to come right now while we stand and while we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't move. Yeah, good morning again, guys. I hope you guys are having a great week. Um, I don't know what your week's been like, but mine has been very busy. And I think, anyone had a busy week this week? Yeah. Anybody? A couple hands. Um, as I'm studying the Word, I keep reading passages of people that were busy or, or maybe have something going on special in their life, and then they encounter Jesus and everything changes. 
Um, and one of the things that I was studying about is how do we make sure that we are keeping God at the center instead of us, right? Sometimes we're, we're guilty when we read scripture of making, making ourselves the center of God's story, if that makes sense, right? And it's, it's called narcissus is a, is a term. It's, it's when I'm inserting myself into scripture as a good guy, right? Uh, anyone ever done that? I mean, I, I do it all the time. Unfortunately, it's something that God's got a temper in me. I, I like to read about, um, you know, the Pharisees and then be like, oh, I'd never do that. Those guys are dumb, right? But in reality, a lot of us would be right there with them, right? Or we'll read about somebody with incredible faith and we'll say, man, that would have been me. Mm -hmm. And really, that's not what scripture is all about. Scripture is all about God at work through Jesus. And it benefits us for sure. But uh, we want to make sure that we keep God at the center. He's the main character, not us, right? It's not about me. Um, I, I want to just share with you this week, even I, I, I talked to some buddies and we're in a men's group and, and we see each other and we kind of hold each other accountable. And I was amazed at, at how almost everything we were talking about was just about me, me, me. One guy said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I, if I like my church anymore. I'm, I'm just not getting fed. I'm thinking, what, what kind of food do they have at your church? Cause that's not what it's all like <laughs> being fed is, uh, if we're mature Christians, right? We it, it comes not from hearing Jeff speak the word to us, but it comes when we're studying, right? And uh, well, I don't know. I just I just don't know if I like my church. And I'm like, well, you know, church is not even about me, right? It's about coming together as a body. Or or you know, they were one guy was talking about a certain thing that he kept dealing with in his life, and she said, I, I just don't know if I can keep doing it anymore. I was like, well, that's exactly right. Like we give it to God, we repent of it, and He takes it from us and forgives us, and we walk in the newness of life, right? And so I was reading this. Oh, and it even got to like communion. One guy said, I don't like the way communion tastes at my church, and I'm like, what? <laughs> what? I don't know if I've ever really thought about that. I mean, because a year ago I was sitting at home taking it in front of a TV. And now I get to take it with my family. So things get in perspective. And that's what I want to share this morning. I came across a story in Luke 13, if you want to turn there. And it's a, it's a brief encounter with Jesus that has amazing uh, results for this woman. It's Luke 13, verse 10. And we're not going to go super deep this morning, but I would encourage you to, to study this this week on your own. On a Sabbath... Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. Just so you know, that word bent over is not like a, it's not like a bad back. This is like a bent over, like 90 degrees. Her eyes are focused on the ground, right? And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you're set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. There are so many cool things going on here. First of all, they're in the synagogue. So Jesus is basically somehow meeting eyes with this woman who is bent totally over and calls her in front of the entire assembly. Isn't that a little different? We wouldn't do that here, would we? <laughs> wouldn't pick on anyone like that. But Jesus brings her up, and she hobbles up. You can almost picture her intentionally stepping, walking up towards Jesus. And he heals her, and she straightens up. 18 years, this woman's eyes were locked to the ground, never seeing a sunset, never seeing the stars in the sky, never seeing the people around her, only focused on what was right in front of her. And yet when she encountered Jesus, her perspective changed forever. There's power in our perspective. And if I'm being honest with you this morning, a lot of times I put myself at the center of God's story. Life becomes all about me, my perspective. Every time I complain about something or every time I get worried, I just take another notch down. And I'm just staring at my feet and I'm not getting anything done because I'm so worried about me, me, me. And it totally contradicts the rest of God's word where we put God first and we put others first. It's about perspective. But when Jesus healed her, everything changed. And so this story reminds us of a passage in Hebrews 12 that we're probably familiar with, and it's going to frame our minds for communion. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. 
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Every time I feel weary, uh, every time I start to lose heart, it's because my eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. And, and that doesn't mean that everything's always going to be all right from a physical perspective all the time. A woman didn't do anything on her own to get to that. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome. Right? So regardless of what's going on in our lives, when we start fixing our eyes on Jesus, we start seeing him for who he really is, and he becomes the center of the story. As we get ready to take this communion, go ahead and take the bread, and I'm going to pray for it. Father, thank you for Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith, Lord, that scorned the cross and all its shame and went there willingly for us, even, even when we were unworthy, while we were still sinners, Lord. And you died for us. Jesus died for us, Lord, so that we could have life. So as we take this bread, help us to remember that it's all about him. And yet, in the middle of that, while our sins weighed on Jesus, as he took those sins uh, on the cross for us, Lord, he was thinking of us. You were thinking of us, Father. And so we think of you, and we pray that our perspective will be eternally shifted. Thank you for Jesus and the cross and this bread that represents his body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, you loved us enough to send Jesus. There's no other name. There's no other way to get to you but through Jesus, Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to you except through him. Father, we affirm that this morning. We walk in that truth, in that life, Lord. Uh, just forgive us when we fall short. Forgive us when we commit those sins, Lord, the same sins that Jesus died for. Uh, and help us to, to walk with you, Lord, in a, in a heart of repentance, to walk by faith. Uh, so that we can just continue to be obedient to, to your will and so that our story will look more like you, Father. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us of our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. This morning, we have an opportunity to give back to God what he's already blessed us with. I'm often reminded of the only time in scripture where God calls his people to put him to the test, and it's in the tithe, and that's in Malachi 3. You can check that out, but that's the only time God challenges us to test him. Put him to the test. He says, give and see if I don't overflow your barns in, in an abundance, and we don't give because we think that God's going to uh, increase our bank account. It's not a prosperity gospel type thing, but it's really just understanding that he's the one in control. And that as I've said the past couple weeks, we're just stewards of that. And so what God's given us, uh, he expects us to, to give back, to be a blessing to others. And so as we give this morning, uh, think about that. Um, you can put your offerings on the baskets on the way out. You can set up a giving profile online on our website, uh, or you can give through text. And uh, we're going to pray for the offering here. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to give, Lord. Um, I know that for, for me, uh, you've changed my heart in that, and you've changed my perspective uh, when it comes to giving because I've seen firsthand that you're able to do more uh, with, with my resources than I am for your kingdom, Lord. So shift our perspective to help us to straighten up, uh, just like that woman when it comes to all things, but even in our finances, Lord, that as we give, um, you're blessing others and you're helping uh, grow our faith and our obedience, Lord. So thank you for the opportunity to give. We pray for those that will receive it, uh, for all of the needs in our church, our community, and our world, Lord, that you're overall and that um, we'll be faithful when we have opportunities to bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Okay, I've got uh, quite a list to share with you this morning of things we need to be praying for and thinking about. Uh, Gloria Green remains in the hospital in Tampa. It'll be three weeks this coming Tuesday, I believe. Uh, she may be a little bit better, a little bit stronger. Uh, her voice is stronger. She's getting up a little bit more. They're difficult, having difficulty with her blood pressure, so that's kind of going on. So we need to continue to pray for her. Elaine Smith, who is Hilda Hollinsworth's uh, mom, is now out at Bridgewater Park Rehab, and so we need to pray for her continued improvement. And also, Hilda uh, is in a boot. Uh, she did something to a tendon in her foot, so we need to be praying for her also. Um, Betty Farber, who is Dira Tolleson's sister-in-law, is in the hospital. It's been a very, very difficult week for her and Dira. Some decisions have to be made about how to handle Betty in the best kind of way, so we really need to be praying about that, thinking about that for her sake. Uh, Savannah Carswell, who uh, is the Carswell's granddaughter-in-law, has had a serious, serious case of pneumonia this week. At one point, she was on 100% oxygen. That's down to 50%, so things are looking better. So continue to pray for her. For her, Enid is here this morning, but last Sunday, she had a fall and a scare and banged herself up. No broken bones or anything, but still very sore, so... Don't be patting her on the back today or anything. If you give her a hug, make it gentle. Um, Amy Lane, who had this uh, intestinal surgery a few weeks ago, I got a text from her this morning that said the nurse said things are really starting to look good. She's really starting to mend. So she's going to still be at home for a little while, but she wants to thank all of you for everything you've done, your prayers, your cards, the food. Just uh, been an outpouring of love. So we want to, to, re to remember uh, her. Uh, Mary Lauderdale and Dennis still have some ongoing issues they're going to be dealing with, so we want to be praying for them. By the way, happy anniversary to Dennis and Teresa today, 40, so y'all can see them after church and tell them congratulations for that. Also, two announcements. Don't forget the Spiritual Growth Work or Equip Conference is coming up July 22nd through the 25th. You can now go online, look at the entire program. It's all, all the classes and all those kinds of things are on there. And uh, also, you can register to go, which is free. You can also make your hotel reserv reservations. And if you're going to go, right now the reservations are $120 a night, which is a great rate for this hotel in Orlando. But it needs to be taken care of before June 21st to guarantee that price. So go online, look at it. I guarantee you, you will be blessed by being there. It's going to be a great weekend. And uh, you can spend one night or two nights or three nights, whatever you want to spend, but you'll be blessed by being there. Also, I need to let you know that next Sunday afternoon, uh, as a part of our ongoing uh, need to recruit teachers and workers um, and, and to do that in a safe environment. As you know, we go through background checks uh, for, for our workers, but we also have to go through a safety seminar to do some training. And that'll be going on next Sunday afternoon right after worship. It's not that long. It's not that difficult, but it is something that we need to go through in order to be qualified to be able to work in the program in a safe in a safe fashion. So if you're interested at all at being at work, we need teachers. You know, as we start to open back up eventually, and as we are working right now with the youth group on Sunday nights, we still need people who are trained and, and go through that process. So if you're interested in that, plan on hanging around next Sunday for a little while and participating uh, in that process. A couple quick things here. I got one other thing. Oh. You got one other thing? Yeah, let me do this. Yeah, really. um, this is given to me by Gerald Fletcher earlier. Jessica Hutchinson, uh, who is uh, Ed Connerty's uh, granddaughter, okay, in law, is married to married to Thomas, who is his grandson. Uh, it's Ed and Barbara's grand, uh, grandson, Thomas. Uh, she's 35 years old and had a heart attack this week. Um, due to a blood-borne uh, arterial infection um, that just decimated her mitral valve. And so she is uh, in critical care at Shands in Gainesville, very serious condition. She underwent a 10-hour sur surgery to replace her mitral valve uh, and is scheduled to have a procedure on Monday to cleanse her heart valve. Uh, uh, to to that part of the body. So it's very serious condition, 35 years old. And so we want to you remember her in her prayers. Her name is Jessica Hutchinson. Okay, well, I've, I've got a little bit of youth group news. Um, next Sunday, we're going to leave here at 1 p.m. We're going to Sanford for a CYF. 
Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that, it's basically like youth group on steroids. It's a bunch of different um, youth groups and everything that come together. So we're going to meet in Sanford, but we're leaving at one. Um, and then also on the 30th in two weeks, we have a graduate, Jeff. We got Cassandra Zicklai. Yeah. Where's she at? Hey, she's graduating soon. And yeah, she's also really smart. Like she's graduating IB. So if you don't know what that is, it's uh, really smart. So great kid too. And so we're going to celebrate her on the 30th. Um, and so they'll have a little table out there. So if you want to get cards and stuff and just celebrate her. Uh, so that's it. One announcement that we just got. Uh, uh, Patricia tried to ask us to be praying for Stuart. As you know, he has problems with getting these sores on his feet and those kinds of things. And apparently that's afflicting him again. So he's got some serious things going on with that. So she's asked us to pray for him also. If we'll remember him. Let's pray and, and then we'll have you come and lead us. Dear God, thank you so much for uh, being with us this morning. Thank you for everything that's happened to edify us and to praise you. Father, we always want to be able to have those two things. Father, we got an extensive prayer list of which we've read aloud this morning. You know every need, who they are, what they are, what needs to be done. And so, God, we're asking you to work in that. But most of all, Father, we're asking you for your will to be done in their lives. Father, we're asking you to heal those who, who need to be healed, to comfort those who need to be comforted. But, Father, we need to see your presence on a regular basis to thank you for all that you do for us. We ask you to be with us as we continue to serve you. Help us to reach out to those who are hurting, to comfort the afflicted, Father, and help us to try to encourage each other by being involved in the program here at church. But we just need your help in all those areas. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you'll be standing up, Jordan, to come and lead us in a closing song, and after that, we'll be dismissed. Have a great week. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the death of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. You are beautiful beyond description. To marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the death of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe.